uh, thank you for the organizers and we'll begin our panel i would like to invite uh, invite the panelists uh, uh, to join uh, the panel uh, dr priyank rathod uh, dr hani parekh dr avinash talele dr maitrik mehta and dr samrinder das uh, i hope uh, everybody is there yes. uh, so this is a case based panel discussion uh, focusing on targeted therapies in uh, in the with concurrent with radiation and head and neck squamous carcinoma so we move on to the first case and uh, this is a case of a 51 year old uh, male patient who presented with the moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma of the oropharynx uh, which was the subsite was vallecular and these are the parameters as you can see height weight the laboratory parameters and his hearing test uh, so we'll start with our panelist uh, regarding the choice of systemic therapy in such in this patient. So as you can see, uh, the patient's uh, lab parameters, ECG, ECHO is normal, and uh, the viral markers are non-reactive, and he has no other major comorbidities or concomitant illnesses. Uh, if you look at the uh, the pyotone audiometry uh, figures in that light, you can see that he has a, a sensory neural hearing loss at higher frequencies and uh, which has uh, been quantified as 35 uh, decibels and 22.5 decibels in the right and ear, left ears respectively. So this is a patient, a real patient who came to our OPD. Uh, so my uh, first question would go to uh, medical oncologist, uh, Dr. Avinash. Uh, sir, would, what would be the choice of concurrent systemic therapy in this patient if this patient had presented to you in the clinic? Well, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Dr. Nandini. Hi. Uh, so my preferred choice is with uh, the current scenario would I would go with uh, the targeted therapy, concurrent targeted therapy for this patient. Uh, so which would be your, which drug would be your preference? Which of that? Thank you, sir. So any uh, reason for which we would not prefer cisplatin or any other chemotherapy in this particular patient for why you would prefer cetuximab over the standard cisplatin? So because uh, I am assuming that he has no financial constraints. Uh, the patient is fit, 51 years old, PS1, and he already has a documented uh, sensory neural deafness. And chutuximab is better than cisplatin, in my experience. That would offer Thank him the you, best. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so be before moving on to the next case, I would like to ask our uh, uh, radiation oncologist uh, who are with us today, uh, Dr. Maitrik Mehta, uh, who can take the question if, uh, uh, what is the experience, how common is the use of cetuximab uh, in your setting uh, and uh, how many patients really end up getting cetuximab in, in real world setting in our country for whatever actually, indication? Uh, actually, first of all, if it is, uh, am I audible? Yes, sir, you're audible. Uh, first, uh, first of all, for this patient, as it is clinically entry B, which is more than six centimeters size of tumor node. In yes, our setup in JCRI, usually what we do, such kind of huge node uh, where patient is clinically T3 C and even entry B, uh, why, why we should take first patient, uh, uh, take patient for first concurrent chemo radiation? Curative CTRT. The first patient will be that. The second question is, uh, if, if we want to go ahead with curative CTRT, most of the times uh, in such a huge node, uh, we send patient for new adjunct chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. Even though it has not been advantageous, but still in clinical practice, we send patient for new adjunct chemotherapy. Third thing, if at all, if we want to uh, uh, take this patient for concurrent chemo radiation, as far as, as government setup is concerned in GCRI, if uh, uh, actually patient is affordable, then and then only uh, in our medical oncologists, they offer the uh, Otherwise, most of the times, they give cisplatin only. Cetuximab is highly spe uh, specified to only financial uh, constraints where the patient is suitable for cetuximab. For financial, otherwise, risk cisplatin is uh, the uh, treatment of choice in government setups. Thank you, sir. Thank you for this perspective. Yeah. Uh, there is a question on the chat box, which I will uh, pose to our both our medical oncologists, Dr. Parikh and Dr. Avinash. Uh, sir, uh, what percentage of, uh, I mean, what is the routine practice? Do, do all of you do uh, routine PTA for each patient for any setting, whether it is a uh, CTRT or a new adjuvant setting, is it routinely done uh, a PTA at baseline and in follow-up? Dr. Parikh, uh, would you like to take the question, sir? Yeah. Dr. Menon, can I come in? Yes, sir. Yeah. 
So uh, regarding this case, uh, when you started the discussion, this patient already has a mild sensory neuron hearing loss. So it would be fall into a category of cisplatin in, in, in ineligible patient. And regarding the cetuximab, you posted a question like, uh, what are the percentage of patients who go for cetuximab? The toxicity profile of cetuximab, as we all know, is not so it's not that safe compared to other targeted molecular therapies. And these patients do have enough uh, skin toxicity and mucositis. So that is really a concern. So we wouldn't uh, prefer as such going for cetuximab unless and until the patient is uh, spreading in allergy. Agree, agree with you. So I was actually coming to that in the subsequent slides uh, regarding the toxicity aspects. Uh, uh, so, uh, Dr. Avinash, uh, sir, would you like to uh, uh, discuss uh, regarding the routine use of PTA? Because a lot of our patients we see are fit. For example, this patient has no other issues except a high uh, sensory neural uh, hearing loss and not a very significant uh, speech difficulty, some mild difficulty in speech and understanding. So, in every patient or including asymptomatic patients with no clinically evident uh, hearing impairment, uh, would you be justified in depriving them of the benefit of cisplatin by doing a PTA? Do we routinely do PTA in, in out of academic centers as well? So I don't push them for routine PTA, but I do advise it on paper. I mean, if they do, it is fine. If they don't, uh, if they are not doing it. So it is more for me actually to save myself. Yeah, because uh, recently last year I had faced some challenges that uh, was not advised. So sometimes the people from some educated uh, crowd or some relatives in US, so they consult their other, but they take second opinions and sometimes we have to answer unless I had to answer some lot of unnecessary questions. So after that, routinely in a charitable setup or in a government uh, setup, trust setup, uh, I don't advise, but uh, there, there is an elite population, I do advise that. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, anybody else on the panel, Dr. Mehta, Dr. Rato, Dr. Dash, what, what is the trend in uh, your one respective thing, Dr. Nandini, and one thing that I'm really concerned about the weight of this patient. The weight yes, is sir. hardly 34. 30, okay, yes, so, yes. I still, uh, for that is also bothering me whether he would tolerate and complete uh, with his platter. Concurrent, yes, sir. Uh, so, any of the others, all who, all of us, most of us work in cost constraint settings. So, uh, sir, would you have anybody have comments on routine use of PTA in their setting? Anyone would like to add to the discussion? So, uh, Dr. Menon, if I can come in, I mean, there, there is a now, now there is an increasing trend towards the gradual acceptance of three weekly cisplatin. You know? So when you started with three weekly cisplatin, if you're giving it concurrent, definitely this PT has to be a concern, though there is a financial burden on the patient also. But if you are really uh, taking this patient for three weekly concurrent CRT, then of course PTA should be done. Should be done. In government setup, most of the people will not do uh, three weekly cisplatin. Still, they prefer weekly cisplatin only. And even in the 34 kg weight, in 34 kg weight, in such a huge node, even I doubt for this patient that uh, he might go ahead for concurrent chemo radiation also. Agree, so sir. Agree. Uh, so we'll move on to the the next case and then have a discussion on target therapy subsequent to this case. So this is another patient in, uh, who came to our clinic who was a 60-year-old male who had a, a weight of 79 kgs, a BSA of 1.90, a, a creat of 1.58 with an estimated GFR of 56 ml per minute. And he was a, again an oropharyngeal primary, but he was HPV negative. Again, locally advanced, which was T4 and N2. And uh, rel, uh, the PTA just showed minimal sensory neural hearing loss. And 2D eco and ECG were normal. Uh, but the, the history of comorbidities were there with hypertension and coronary artery disease with the history of uh, angioplasty done uh, three years back uh, for uh, uh, similar for this complaints and he's on antiplatelets and antihypertensives. So I would uh, so the next question is uh, in this patient since we are talking about cisplatin ineligibility, uh, what are the choice of concurrent agents in patients with comorbidities if, even if they are other workup is normal, would you still consider this patient as cisplatin eligible? Uh, anybody can take this question, medical oncologist or radiation oncologist. Ideally, this patient is not eligible for a concurrent cisplatin. 
so what would be the choice? What would you like to consider in these patients who are ineligible? The choice of systemic therapy. Uh, I think RFT. Uh, RFT is high. Yes, sir. Creative. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, sir uh, uh, Dr. Parekh or Dr. Avinash, would you uh, comment on your choice of concurrent therapy in this kind of a scenario? So he, the patient has preserved ejection fraction. So there is no apparent contraindication for hydration as such. And uh, my opinion. But uh, definitely I would first offer him the, benef uh, the benefit of targeted therapy. Better tolerated and there is more uninterrupted. Uh, there is less chance of getting interrupted during the CPI. Process. So I would still offer this patient targeted therapy over suspended. Uh, so the next question uh, would be, uh, what would what would the incidence? Uh, Doctor Das can uh, take this question. What would be the incidence of cisplatin ineligible patients, like the two cases discussed, uh, one with the low body weight and hearing loss, and the other with multiple comorbidities and a borderline renal function, uh, both of which uh, we consider as a contraindication, either absolute or relative to cisplatin. So, what would be the incidence of this kind of uh, patients in your clinical? practice is it very common to have patients who are cisplatin ineligible or who can't be given uh, even weekly cisplatin or is it uh, uh, is it a very rare uh, thing because we at uh, tmh see a significant proportion of cisplatin ineligible patients who are otherwise fit for uh, radical chemo radiation yeah so <clears throat> to answer that question specifically i mean our uh, set of adenic patients are usually advanced patients and these are usually elderly patients and uh, patients do come with uh, DRNs, RFTs and sensory neural problems. So it is not very common to say, but it is quite a common. I mean, at least 20 or to 30 or percentage of patients will be cisplatin ineligible in our practice. So um, except for the absolute contraindications like RFTs and uh, sensory neural thing, there are other things also to look into, like the, uh, I mean, the age of the patient and other factors also. So it's not only about giving as the patient criteria, but you have to look into your setup also where you can provide adequate hydration and all those things also. So that has also to be looked into. Agree, sir. Thank you uh, for bringing up these uh, points. So this is the incidence which we roughly see around. 20% of our patients are cisplatin unfit. And uh, this is what was discussed by Dr. Dash that the criteria for cisplatin ineligibility, uh, it was uh, uh, published some years back and where they had uh, listed a few criteria which uh, uh, we consider the patient cisplatin ineligible. And these were the relative uh, contraindications which uh, Dr. Dash had referred to considering the ECOG performance and the age uh, with the because uh, geriatric assessment and screening tools to be done and also borderline creatinine function like we saw in the patient in the second case and as it has been discussed uh, uh, in during the discussion that a uh, hearing loss which is more than grade 3 uh, renal dysfunction a poor performance status or any life threatening uh, active uh, in disease or autoimmune would be an absolute contraindication and this is uh, what the panelists have already all discussed so again as dr das had just alluded to uh, the impact of age uh, so here it is the patients who received uh, the older they get the benefit of concurrent cisplatin was less and this is what was just mentioned by sir. Similarly, the patient performance status, the uh, the worse or the higher the performance status, uh, the impact of uh, the addition of concurrent agent was worse and uh, this is what we have seen. Uh, so, uh, like we discussed, uh, can we overcome, like, are everything, all criteria for cisplatin ineligibility absolute that you can't give, for example, a weight of 34 or 40 kgs, or is there some way where we can, uh, some of the relative contraindications can be overcome with uh, supportive care? Uh, Dr. Avinash, sir, would you like to take this question? Please, uh, sorry, Dr. Nardini. Uh, please, can you just repeat the question? I, there was a, I just missed out. So, uh, yes, sir. Uh, so in case uh, there are some relative contraindications which are like weight loss or borderline re renal function which are there, which are the patient is not otherwise unfit and these are slightly numerically on the lower side. Like the, in the first case, we saw that the patient's weight was 34 mm -hmm. while all his parameters were good. 
and in the second case we saw the patient had a creat clearance of 56 so these are uh, in the relative contraindication in those criteria so how can we optimize this patients to overcome these factors can it be overcome or if we just have one one of these criteria which in even the relative is it completely we do not use cisplatin or how can we uh, develop any strategies to overcome this criteria well one of the effective ways is uh, to maintain the nutrition in my opinion to maintain the nutrition and to prevent the weight loss if the if we can maintain the if we start a nutrition part before this ctrt and if we are able to maintain the weight of the patient usually the incidences of mucositis and the weight loss is less and they even borderline patients can sail through in my limited experience if they have a weight loss of around 10% or more then usually they end up interrupting in the treatment thank you sir uh, would dr mehta asa would you like to add to this actually uh, uh, this weight loss criteria is before starting treatment or during treatment so at the time so both so at the baseline before planning treatment is what we uh, use and then during treatment we know that it is weight loss is a poor uh, uh, in poor indicator for outcomes as well so at the time of starting treatment so whether we can overcome actually in our government setup in gcri like that if patient is uh, much more weight loss like uh, 10% 20% uh, usually patients do not fit for concurrent chemo uh, ctrt or we may shift to palliative rt only Uh, if at all uh, chemotherapy is required, then it, that is by medical people. And if uh, in concurrent chemo radiation, uh, usually our medical people will switch over to carboplatin rather than cisplatin. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we move on. Uh, so these are the options. What are the options? Like we just discussed. Uh, so without wasting time, uh, we know that the addition of cisplatin to the concurrent uh, radiation had a in the MAC NC trial a a benefit at at five years of six point five percent and long term was around nearly ten percent benefit. And then we also know that in patients. uh with uh, the high dose cisplatin is the preferred regimen in most centers in the west but we know that in our real world setting it is not usually deliverable in a large uh, uh, large number of patients because of multiple factors including logistics and uh, 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 availability of trained uh, uh, oncologists in the remote parts of the country and uh, then we come to the options uh in patients who are contraindications to cisplatin and this was a review article uh, published some time back uh, authored by dr vermokan and these are some of the options he had uh, mentioned in the uh, definitive chemo radiation setting if you look at these and you look at the level of evidence you can see a lot of them uh, do not have very strong levels of evidence uh, except for carbo 5f u with conventional fractionation which is 1b and uh, cetuximab is also used with altered fractionation and the level of evidence is 2b here except for hpv positive and then carbo has a level of evidence 2c so uh, we know a, a lot of times we have alternatives but they are still not as eff effective as cisplatin and if you look at the uh, options discussed for uh the adjuvant setting you can see there are multiple options mentioned and a few of them have a very poor uh, the strength the level of evidence is poor and there's some which has uh, some evidence but they are small phase 2 studies like the combination of cetuximab and docetaxel so these were some of the studies with alternative chemotherapy agents and uh, now moving on to the main part of this uh, panel uh, is the role of targeted therapy that is uh, predominantly egfr inhibitors which are used with radiation so this was the uh, trial by dr bona in which patients with cisplatin who were, these were patients who were cisplatin fit not unfit but they were uh, locally advanced and they were planned for radical radiation with either erbitux that is cetuximab with radiation or radiation alone and uh, these this has become a, a standard of care especially for oropharynx hypopharynx and larynx it is cited in some of the guidelines uh, so this has already been partially discussed before the use of cetuximab in our practice and we already discussed it uh, that very few patients actually we plan cetuximab because of cost and other factors uh what is the common pattern like is cetuximab predominantly used in indian setting in patients who are cisplatin ineligible or we even use it in patients who are cisplatin eligible if they have oropharyngeal or hypopharyngeal tumors uh, uh dr mehta sir would you like to discuss this aspect uh in our setup even in radiation department we have used cetuximab and most of the times we have seen that even sometimes patients who are cisplatin eligible we have used cetuximab 
also uh, in uh, cisplatin ineligible uh, if patient is cisplatin ineligible then another thing comes as a cost cetuximab in indian setup is mainly given to the patients who can afford or there is reimbursement most of the times what what we are seeing in uh, standard uh, routine clinical practice if patient is actually cisplatin eligible uh, in uh, routine practice most of the people will get cisplatin or carboplatin only but it, it's not uh, taken as a standard where uh, cetuximab we take as a standard to uh, treat our patients Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Talele, uh, Dr. Rathod, would you have any difference in opinion um, if it's different in your practice? Oh, definitely. We would offer the best treatment available. And uh, if the patient is uh, avoiding, so we definitely offer cetuximab. The first steps. Thank you, sir. Dr. Rathod, would you like to comment? Uh, my uh, in my GCR experience, we have seen most of the patients uh, they are receiving cisplatin actually because the cost factor in government setup there is a bigger the issues. So cetuximab is very limited role in our setup. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we'll quickly move on to yeah. this. Yes, sir. Yeah, Dr. Mena, I mean, cisplatin eligible, obviously, we'll go for cisplatin first. And all ineligible patients, cetuximab, you know, the major concern is regarding the mucositis and skin toxicity. And yes, the toxicity profile of cetuximab is uh, really very bad to accept for it. But if you don't have any other option like carboplatin or other things, definitely ineligible patient can go for cetuximab. Agree, sir. C completely agree. So this was what I had uh, uh, planned to discuss sir, since you have brought up the topic, the toxicities of cetuximab, especially uh, for uh, patients who are going ongoing radiation. So in your real world experience, how many patients really have dose interruptions or radiation interruptions because of toxicities of cetuximab, such as mucositis and uh, dermatitis? So, uh, I mean, uh, the treatment interruptions are really frequent with cetuximab because you know, by second or third week, these patients uh, usually uh, develop mucositis a week earlier than that of cisplatin, you know. And then uh, most of the patients would have a feeding tube in place uh, to handle those things. Uh, Nutrition-wise, also the patients are depleted. So specific toxicities, I'm really concerned about this uh, mucositis and skin toxicity. Uh, these are really difficult to manage during our treatment. And most of the patients will definitely require feeding tube and all those things during the treatment. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Avinash, uh, sir, how would you man uh, manage from the medical oncology point of view? What are the toxicities we specifically look for? If we plan somebody uh, for an anti-EGFR drug like cetuximab, what should we monitor uh, laboratory-wise, clinically, other than uh, as Dr. Dasha discussed about the mucositis and the dermatitis, which uh, leads to treatment? Uh, in so, in my experience, the dermatitis part is like uh, good. It is, uh, I see it as a surrogative marker for the drug being acting there. So, uh, grade 2, grade 3 rash is, is welcomed, in my opinion, in sun exposed areas. And mucositis and all is, uh, in my opinion, it is less than the uh, less than the cisplatin. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Mehta... Apart from uh, that, sir, uh, the mild transamonitis, grade 2 transamonitis, SGO to SGPT elevation, uh, is commonly observed. Uh, so what about electrolyte imbalances? How commonly do you encounter? In a lot of our palliative patients who take long-term cetuximab with chemo, uh, they frequently present with uh, asymptomatic but sometimes severe hypomagnesemia. So, so how frequent is that in the concurrent chemo radiation setting? Is it as bad as uh, it is in the palliative setting or as bad as cisplatin? What, what is your experience? My experience is, I think these are those patients who have already received already received cisplatin as a part of TPA for CTRT in their previous lines of setting, and they already have pre-existing tubular damages. So uh, I think that myopomagnesemia is partly contributed to the pre previous therapies, but in a up uh, I mean adjuvant or uh, upfront uh, CTRT up first line cetuximab, I hardly encounter any of those hypomagnesemias. Uh, so the next question. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, sir
published another paper on the quality of life and they showed that really they found no significant difference in the QL scores between the treatment arms and uh, they said it was similar in both arms and the pre-treatment global health status QL was a prognostic variable. So uh, as per the, the, the original trial, there wasn't a significant deterioration of the quality of life and it improved after uh, treatment toxicities improved. So is, is this uh, similar in our Indian experience? Dr. Das, would you like to comment? I think uh, you know, clinical practice is a little different from the, what the evidence is here, like the current paper. I mean, uh, we have come across uh, frequent interrup treatment interruptions uh, with cetuximab. So, I mean, that obviously affects the outcomes of the disease. So, the quality of life, uh, I mean, according to the evidence, if you go, but uh, by clinical experience, we feel like it is really difficult to handle with cetuximab in a definite okay. experience. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll skip this case in interest of time and we'll quickly move to the second targeted EGFR uh, agent and uh, that was nimotuzumab. It was uh, discussed in detail in the talk prior to the panel. Uh, so this is the study, which early studies of nimotuzumab with concurrent radiation. And we know it is also a monoclonal antibody targeting the EGFR. Uh, and these are results from the trial from Tata Memorial Hospital, which were presented at ASCO in 2018. So there was an improvement in PF uh, significantly and there was an improvement in disease-free survival and local regional control also was improved and this has been in discussed in detail in the talk previously so I won't uh, cross time. So uh, uh, to the panelists, uh, Mehta sir, what is your experience in uh, in the clinical setting with nematozumab, uh, both in the cisplatin eligible and the inel ineligible setting? Is it frequently used at GCRI cisplatin nematozumab uh, like our trial or do you reserve it for only ineligible patients? Uh, in GCRI, actually, like uh, nematozumab is also costly drug. Uh, as far as government setups are all concerned, which I believe in India, most of the patients who are eligible for cisplatin, they will first use cisplatin only. If it is cisplatin ineligible, they will move ahead to carboplatin if it is visible. But if patient is, uh, <laughs> suppose, uh, financially rich or we can explain to the patient, then and then they will move ahead to biomember cetuximab and biomember cisplatin. Uh, we have given so many uh, uh, biomember to so many patients, but mainly those patients were, uh, were financially uh, rich or reimbursed patients. And another factor in uh, biomember in our setup, we have seen that it is actually to be given with cisplatin. So, yes, RT plus cisplatin versus RT plus parameter plus cisplatin. Yes, so, sir. if we ask the patients, they will usually prefer RT plus cisplatin. Yes, sir. It, it all depends on conversation with the consultant and patient because it, it's not used as a standard, even not in under trial in GCRI also. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Avinash, uh, Dr. Rathod, would you uh, and Dr. Das, is there any difference in opinion or is this the similar pattern in your clinical practice as well? So definitely, cisplatin ineligible patients. Uh, we definitely, I offer nimotuzumab to some patients who are not uh, affording orbitux. It is cheaper, and uh, I have a pretty comfortable. I'm pretty comfortable using nimotuzumab. Thank you, sir. Uh, Doctor Das, uh, sir, would you like to add to this? Yeah, obviously. I mean, uh, uh, the TMH trial. Uh, you take it with cisplatin. And nimotuzumab you cannot give without cisplatin. Yeah, I'm not sure how you extrapolate to uh, other uh, clinical scenarios, but nematumab has essentially to be given with cisplatin if you want that kind of response. And that too, in a particular set of patients like HPV negative and very advanced tumor, where you, where you want to be little aggressive. So that would be the particular uh, selection criteria when you place nematumab. Thank you, sir. Dr. Rathur, would you like to comment? No, same. Thank you, sir. So we'll quickly move on. Uh, so since there's a shortage of time, so just like uh, Dr. Das had discussed, there's HPV uh, P16 negative group. They really are the ones uh, who do poorly and they were the ones who benefited with the addition of uh, nematozumab to cisplatin in this trial as well. And uh, these are the toxicities uh, with uh, nematozumab not as bad as cetuximab, but again, mucositis was significantly higher in those who uh, received, um, in the grade three to five was significantly higher in the cisplatin nematozumab combination. And we uh, also, uh, what is the experience of, uh, the main question I had to ask, and we discussed it is whether you, you the experience with nematozumab as a single agent, and most of the panelists do not prefer it. 
uh, also in my experience uh, patients who have very bulky disease large nodes like the first case with a single agent nematozumab and rt uh, some many patients have significant residual disease uh, in some of the affording patients who were cisplatin ineligible but the others who don't have bulky disease seem to fare okay so we also predominantly use it with cisplatin and in select patients who are not fit for cisplatin or cetuximab we also give a nematozumab with rt alone so again, but this was a call. I am sorry to interrupt, but as a single agent, is uh, is uh, nimotuzumab can be recommended? Sir, no, sir. We only give it to some very few patients. So nothing can be used in that scenario. Not as a routine. We don't give it as standard of care. Okay. Uh, so this was the quality of life and uh, we also analyzed this and there was an, again, there was a worsening during treatment due to toxicities, but the addition of nematozumab, though increased the mucositis rate significantly as compared to cisplatin alone, did not uh, significantly worsen the quality of life. And uh, with this, uh, I would like to just uh, conclude the discussion and uh, any concluding remarks from all our panelists, if they would like to add to it. Mehta, sir, anything that you would uh, like to no, That's a really nice discussion. But uh, as far as uh, you are in government setup and even I am in GCRI, our first preference will be cisplatin. If yes, cisplatin is eligible, we may shift to carboplatin. Most of the time, uh, cetuximab or nematozumab, what we use in our setup is mainly uh, the patients who are financially rich or who are very okay. that, that, that is standard clinical practice which we are doing. But uh, we uh, do not take cetuximab or nematozumab in replacement of cisplatin. A patient is ideally eligible for cisplatin, we give cisplatin only. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Avinash, sir, would you like to summarize? Yes, yes. I completely agree with uh, Dr. Maitri. And uh, so I agree with his thoughts. Yes. Dr. Rathor, would you like to Possibly. add to no, yes. Dr. Das. Uh... Yeah, Dr. Menon, I mean, just, just a final point I want to mention. I mean, there, there is a lot of uh, debate uh, regarding use of nematozumab. Uh, taken apart the financial aspect, even the clinical consensus guideline from India that was published in 2020 by Pravasar itself, they recommend nematozumab now as a, I mean, selected category one recommendation along with this spread. So, uh, there is a lot to accept, uh, keeping apart the financial um, part. Uh, but uh, right now we are moving into a phase where nematozumab will definitely come with into play during the future. So that would be the takeaway. Thank you. Uh, a very special thank you to all our panelists for the great day. Nandin is how here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, sir. That's a simple thing. I think uh, the affordability and affordability goes as a second thing. First thing, the take-home message is cisplatin is the drug to go to drug along with radiotherapy and that is superior irrespective of whatever you do. In the ineligible, if there's financially okay, HPV negative, that's a group which you alluded and summary and alluded to. That would be probably where you can add these agents which you are looking at EGFR. That's how I look at it. Otherwise, you are no, no, you have data, although level two, which you spoke of, of carboplatin with taxines, carboplatin with 5FU. We somehow forget that this is also a good alternative for those who are cisplatin ineligible and cannot, do not have the deep pockets. So I think that is where I will take up and the RT hyperfractionation is a, also an alternative which you spoke to. That's how I think. Yes, sir. Thank yes, you, sir. sir. Thank you so much for that uh, insight. Uh, so since we are running short of time, we'll conclude. I would like to thank all the panelists for the great discussion. Thank you, Sahu, sir, for summarizing everything so well. And I would like to conclude the uh, discussion and hand, hand it over back to the organizers. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. Nansi. Thank you, Dr. Dignesh and all the panelists. It was a wonderful talk. I think uh, we're running short of time, so we will not waste time and you know, not take any Q&As and shift to the next session. <laughs>